right, so um, I'm going to talk about Lift a Curves today. This is a um, uh, kind of a hobby project of mine to try to understand what's going on in, in Bitcoin signatures and um, from like a kind of a very introductory level. Because I, I think um, there's a lot of great resources out there. Like a lot of this is built on Jimmy Song's work. There's a few, few great like blog posts about elliptic curves, but I feel like um, there's kind of a gap between like uh, like the implementation side of it and like just like the intuitive kind of nature of the thing. Um, and, and, <laughs> and by that I mean it's not intuitive at all. Uh, so yeah, I kind of want to take things back to like um, uh, the old days of when people used to do math before algebra and computers. And um, back then, everything was, uh, hold on a second. Let's see if I can load this applet. Okay, there we go. So um, back then, like, mathematicians were, were actually called like, geometers, basically. Like, uh, they just did, they had like rulers and straight edges and uh, compasses, and they tried to like derive all of the the laws of nature through that. It didn't work out too well, um, but uh, but we can actually like we use some of those basic techniques that, that they had back then, where um, you just define like points and um, curves, and you try to walk around curves and define like your geometry through that. So. Um, Turns out, like elliptic curves are easier to understand if you approach it from this kind of visual nature, at least in, in my opinion. So, uh, just to like take you back to like high school algebra, and who, has anyone had heard this talk before or part of it? Okay, cool. So, um, everybody who has this left. So. Uh, yeah. So, a lot of people um, kind of uh, when you when you're introduced to to curves or sort of given like it, it, expressions like this, like ax squared yeah, yeah, plus bx uh, plus c. And uh, so like here's, a, um, here's an example of parabola. You can slide it around. But you may not know, like you can just, uh, there, there are, um, uh, not all curves are functional in the sense that like for every x there's a single y. That's what, I, what we typically think are introduced to functions um, in like high school is like these things that don't overlap themselves. Uh, but yeah, you can just, you can define functions that are turned on their side like this, and you can even define functions that are, uh, you know, go in circles. Um, so this is just to remind you that um, like there's an algebraic way to look at things, and then there's this kind of more geometric way to look at things. So that's how we're gonna start approaching this. So an elliptic curve is just another function, basically. So instead of you know that simple parabola, we have this uh, this new function, um, but it has some kind of strange properties. So for one, um, we can slide these around. So like, uh, so this is this is the expression, and so as you as you like change a, it kind of squishes it this way, and b kind of squeezes it down this way, and it will actually like bifurcate if you bring B all the way down here. Um, and then we have these things called points, which are just, um, you know, this, this point satisfies this solution. So each value of x and y for P, if you plug that in to these, this equation with those values, you'll get something that um, a lot lies along that line. So we're going to introduce this concept of Point negation. I think I, I might have to like shrink this down a bit so that it's a fit. Yeah. So um, this curve up here that we're manipulating uh, in Bitcoin, the values here are just a equals zero, and uh, this is a little bit of foreshadowing. But a equals zero, b equals seven. So that's Bitcoin's elliptic curve, but looked at in a what we call like a continuous space. Um, so basically there's an infinite number of points on this curve and uh, uh, it's sort of unbounded. All right, so next, um, yeah, so we have this point and we can define the, the negative of the point, which is 
um, basically the mirror of it or all the x-axis. So this is kind of different from how you might think of taking the negative of a, of a point. Like usually if you just multiply position, like x position and y position by negative one, you'd end up like down here in this quadrant, right? But out here, there's no, like none of the points out here satisfy this expression. So that doesn't really help us. So we can just redefine what we mean by negation um, in order to stay on this curve. So, which is kind of a, like this is starts to be where, like, your what you've taught, what you've learned at, in algebra in like high school, just a lot of the rules kind of go out the window. Like you have to like think back of like, all right, like I don't have algebra, but I do have this concept of like. Um, uh, this like reflection idea. And so we can we can talk about the mirror here. So all right, so now we're gonna discuss like this idea of point addition. So again, once again, like in algebra, if you were to add two points together, you just take their x values and their y uh, add them together and their y values and add them together. So not so here because um, if you did that, like you would not be on that curve again. So what if we just defined addition to be, uh, we, we, we draw a line from, say we're adding P and Q, we draw a line from P through Q, and we're gonna hit this curve again somewhere. And instead of calling that the, the sum of these two, we're actually gonna say this is the negative of the sum. So the, the, the point R is actually down here. So basically we draw a line from here, boop, boop, and then jump down here. So you might wonder, like, why is that the negative? Like, why not just like make the like p plus q is r up here? Well, if you do it this way, then you get this nice property that if you add p, q, and r on one side of the expression, then they add up to zero. And that's like a classic mathematician thing where like they like everything to be either zero or infinity or one or whatever. Um, but it's, uh, it basically makes it like um, uh, symmetric with respect to any one variable. So we could ask like, well, so now we can say like Q plus R is negative P and, and so forth. So you might wonder like what happens, like why is there only one value here? Like this is, like could I pick two things like P and Q where it, this line will intersect the curve again? And basically, because this elliptic curve just like spans out forever, you'll, you'll only intersect it once. Uh, well, it'll we'll only have at most three inters. Any line uh, will only intersect it at most three times. Basically. So, um, and then so like if you, for example, if you draw p below q, you can see like this line will never intersect the. Um, it'll never intersect the curve again. So we, um, we might say like, well, the intersection happens at infinity. It just happens in some space that's not even in our, in our like, plane anymore. So yeah, so basically if P is negative Q, if, if one is the reflection of the other, then we say they add it to infinity. All right, so now we start to get into like the fun stuff, like where this actually relates to Bitcoin. Um, uh, I mean, all of this relates to Bitcoin, but I says everything, like, of course. Uh, so if you start, like, consider that what we did was we, um, we iterated from, uh, like, when we took, oh, sorry, uh, if we take P and we set it equal to Q, sorry, let me back up a little bit to just illustrate that point. If P equals Q, we get like this tangent line that just touches the curve, but it still intersects the curve at like at this location in this, in this case. So when you add P to itself, uh, which, uh, which we might call multiplication, then you still get an intersection. So P plus Q, or P plus itself is going to be something. So now imagine you do that over and over again. So let's say you start at this point, we'll call it G for, um, what's known as the generator plane. And we add G to itself, we'll, we'll get down here, this would be G1, and then we add G1 uh, to itself, and we'll get down here to G sub N. 
So um, if I didn't show you the path, it would actually it would be very difficult to guess how many iterations it takes to get from here to here. Like basically these two like as I drag it around and it's, it becomes a little bit more obvious, you see how it like like it looked like it was just gonna keep going in that direction, but then it came back up here. And um, and that's just after three iterations. Um, this is this is really key to why elliptic curves are really um, useful for cryptography because they have this kind of one-way nature that if you start at a point, um, if you choose the point uh, somewhat judiciously, um, and you you go n steps to some other point, it's very hard to tell how many steps you took to get to that that. Point. Um, and especially when n is very large. Like when n is small, you can kind of brute force it, like there are only three steps. But when you're talking about the numbers that like SecP256 uses, it's it starts to be, you know, like on the, the order of like stars in the universe, like or atoms or in the universe, something like that. So you're not just gonna guess um, someone's uh, n value, which is, is just an integer, but effectively, effectively that is what we use as private keys, are just this, these integers that get multiplied um, by a generator point, uh, and you end up at some other point, and that's what we call our public keys. So throughout the rest of the talk, I kind of want to hammer in that like your, your private key is just a number, your public key is a point, on this curve, it has, so your public key always has two values implicitly, like an x and a y coordinate, and your private key is just like some number, just like five, but just much bigger. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So when we get into, we're going to transition to like the discrete version part of this talk, where uh, we start getting into like implementing this stuff on a computer, and. Um, basically, what we're going to do is like, we can't deal with an infinite uh, um, set of points, like arbitrary points. Uh, at least, not yet, I don't know, someone's come up with the way of doing symbolic elliptic curve photography. But basically, all the properties of the elliptic curve in the continuous sense, they actually carry over to the discrete sense. So, like, specifically what I mean is like, let's, instead of saying like, x can just be any value between 0 and 1. Let's say, like, no, x can be 0, it can be 1, 2, 3, up to n, but nothing in between. And then furthermore, we're going to squeeze all of these values into a little box using, like, what I call Pac-Man math, um, or mod modular arithmetic. So the view here is like, so this curve, uh, every time we go outside this curve, we're going to wrap back into this box. So we can choose the size of this box. And um, uh, the problem is that like, if we try to wrap an infinite curve into this box, then um, it kind of breaks GeoGebra because like, there's, uh, basically it fills the box entirely. There's no point that isn't some eventually getting wrapped into that box. So, uh, it gets a little hard to illustrate like the jump from the continuous to the finite modular space, but we're gonna forge ahead anyway. And um, by the way, like I put this up on a on a droplet, so if you want to like run this yourself, you can either go to my GitHub and run it locally, or you can run it through the through the web here. All right, so we are gonna. Um, we have like a few. We're gonna try to get through like all the way up to the signatures part, which I just added like today, um, uh, mostly for Chris's benefit because he's like, "Why should I come to your talk? I've already seen." But okay, so all of the things that we I said before, all the things we did in the continuous space, they actually carry over to this finite space. So now instead of looking at that curve, we're gonna, as we said before, we use the modular operator to wrap the solutions back into the fixed space. And you can choose a much smaller space than the one Bitcoin uses in order to illustrate these points. Um, 
So, for example, this space has um, 39 points where if you, if you plug these values in, these integers, into this, this equation, they satisfy this equation. Um, modulo the, the size of the box, which is, I think, uh, 37. So you try to choose like prime numbers for the size of your box that you're modulating up with. Um, so, like if, I said before, like if we can do addition, for example. So, like, whoosh. Uh, that's not good. Oh, that's right. Okay. So let me go back to. So I'm running this uh, under Docker container on my machine. Just in case the internet's not working. Okay. So um, we can do modular um, addition, but on the, the finite curve. So if we add these two points, 925 and 1625, we get uh, this third point down here. And that's that's because like if you imagine like a line going through here and extending um, using like Pac-Man rules. You'd come back up here, and the, when the line eventually intersects the curve again, it, it'll happen up there. So I'm still trying to work out how to like show that graphing, but it's difficult. So um, as I said before, like what if you had one point that's right below another point? You get this point at infinity. So there's there's no third point that's along this line. Um, which is it, kind of interesting to note that like uh, once you've got like one point, you can always compute the bottom point below it. And since there's no third point that intersects, it means that the x coordinate is essentially um, there's only going to be one y coordinate for every x coordinate that you have a public key. It's sort of an aside there, but. Uh, so yeah, so we, if you choose two points, you can do addition. If you choose a point and add it to itself, let's see if I can do that. You get this uh, multiplication. So 1924 plus 1924 is 912. And again, like if you added the x coordinates, you would not get this value. It's you have to sort of step along the curve. So um, yeah, I'm using I'm going to use a is and a is zero, B is seven, but you can change the, all of these parameters. If you raise it up, uh, you'll see there's, yeah, in this case, there's 127 points, and you can just, um, you know, keep, uh, like, expanding the field. So you can kind of start, it starts to look kind of like a star field, like, you know, the night sky. The points are basically randomly, um, uniformly distributed. And except that it has that symmetry along the horizontal line. So you can think of like your public key is like, a, is like an atom just like out there in the universe and no one's ever going to find it. So that's a uh, or you know. Anyway, I, I, I like to think about these things sometimes. So. <laughs> All right, I'm going to back this down to 37. Um, okay, so point multiplication. Um, let me let me just refresh this because I've I've tested this more with these values. Okay, so if we take a point and we start adding or start multiplying, um, basically adding it to itself multiple times, you'll find that you kind of mark you start to march around and and touch all of like a, a sort of a subset of these positions. And the interesting thing is like. Like in this space, there's 39 points that solve the, this expression, these white locations, but there's only 13 points that you can reach if you start at this point. So this is this is what's known as the subgroup of the uh, of the finite field. So basically, depending on where you start, it determines like how many of the points you can reach. Um, in Bitcoin, because they use a prime uh, because it uses like a prime field, it turns out that there's only, um, if you start at Bitcoin's generator point, you can reach any point in the entire space. But, um, but like, that's because of how those things were chosen. In this case, um, when you're dealing with much smaller fields, it's important to note that 
which like field you're working in, and this will come up later when we start um, doing some actual building an application around this. So this is where you take a generator point and you and you add it to itself again and again and again, you iterate through all the points, but sometimes you might not, you might miss a bunch of the points. Yeah. You can so just wrap around to the first one again. Yeah. You you uh, yeah you can see that um, I have a. Um, does anyone know why this screen is like stretched out? Is it? <laughs> I, I always forget how to do this on a Mac, but I have this little like disk over here. So we can hop around and show, and like kind of to illustrate the point that you're, it's, it's like you're going around a clock, um, and every time you get back to zero or infinity, it like starts you over. But depending on where you start, this, there's more value, the more places you can go in this clock. So in this case. And then um, down here, uh, if you want to like go through, I, I made some problems that for this so that you can kind of start to let this germinate a bit if it's not like intuitive yet. I understand it. it's like a lot of new stuff, but I'm trying to keep it on the picture side, so limit the number of equations shown. But one of, one of the cool things about this is that a lot of properties of multiplication still hold. Like for instance, um, like you know how in multiplication, you, like two times three is the same as three times two? Uh, well that also holds in point multiplication. So here, two times this value is eight one, and three times that value is this other one here. So what if I did like, Two times, or um, thirty-two twenty. Well, that's like doing two times three times eight times twenty. And we know that two times three is six, and three times two is six. So if I start at eight twenty, eighteen twenty, and I and I um, multiply by six, what am I going to get? Do I get the same value either way? And the answer is yes. So, <laughs> um, so that's that's going to be important for how like. Uh, different elliptic curve algorithms um, take advantage of this property of like, so yeah, in fact, we'll see that in the next application here. Um, I can pause if anybody is like, wants to ask a question, or how are you, how are you all doing? How are you all doing today? Chris, I'll be your guy. <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how this fits into the, the signing algorithm and then the verification yeah. yeah, I'm kind of a, a high level. We're, it feels like we're like really in the. We're we're getting to that. Yeah, we're kind of building the the tools that we need to actually answer the sign, like what a signature is. Um. So uh, so the 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 easiest application you can build with this is is um, Shamir's secret sharing. I think it's Shamir's secret sharing. Um, we have like an Alice and Bob pair. What? How much time do I have? I'll, I'll try to um, be brief. So, uh, so remember I, we said that like a private key is just an integer. So in this case, like Alice can choose a private key, her integers is five, and Bob can choose a private key, his integers are just gonna be seven. And Alice can come up with a public key. So let's say she chooses this point. She's like, okay, five times 24, 20 is my public key, six, one. And if Bob uses the same public key, or the same generator point that Alice used, um, so in this case, she said 2420, so if he uses 2420, which is here, he's gonna get his own public key. So in his case, it's 836. So he's like, all right, cool, we have this, um, uh, so like they, they, they have this ability to now create what's called a shared secret by using that property we just saw before where two times three is the same as three times two in point multiplication. So suppose like uh, Alice computes, like she looks at his public key and she computes her private, she takes her private key, which is five, and she multiplies by his public key, which is 836. She should get the same thing that he gets if he takes his private key, which is seven, and multiplies by her public key. Because when they multiply them together, they get uh, 
you know. Um, <laughs> so they, 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 uh, they should get the same result either way. So let's, let's walk through that here. So Alice, um, this is the Alice side. She looks up Bob's public keys, 836. So where is that? 8 is, uh, 836 is up here, I think. So she says, okay, 5 times 836 is 3220. And then he does the same thing with her public key. So her public key is 61. So if I put them down here, 6, 1, and he sees, I need to move my window over. The suspense is killing me. Yeah, so he gets 32.20. So um, the interesting thing is, like, only Alice and Bob could have computed this number, this, this position, 32.20. And because of that, they can use that information to encrypt messages to each other. So let me... Okay, so that's because they both started from the same generator point. Yes. Okay, so that's because they, they both started from the same generator point, but they multiplied the generator point by their own private keys. Exactly, yeah. And what would, hap what would happen if they used different points? So, so let's say she didn't tell him what the generator point was, he just chose his own. In that case, uh, he would get, he would compute a different secret from hers, and it would no longer be a shared secret because it's not shared between them, like it, not the same. That's, so, um, I do have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, I'm not too familiar with generic secret sharing, but um, this does seem like it elliptic curve to be on it. Like, is it, how's it, um, secret? Sharing, I guess, separate from it, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, it, this is what to curve to be on. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I, I think I just messed up their book. He's, so, so who's, who's was there to? Wait, it's Diffie Hellman. Sorry, it's Diffie Hellman. That's different from DSA, right? Uh, so there's, diff, there's Diffie, Diffie Hellman is, so there's DC, I'm oh, sorry. Um, there's like, uh, I'm, I'm confusing. Then I'm not going to remember which one is which, but I have a whole bunch of references if you want. So, so Shamir secret sharing uses Diffie Hellman. Is that it's a yeah, Diffie Hellman's like a method to to do it, and dip, and, and um, ECDSA is just one. Well, it's not. Just, yeah, yeah, ECDSA is one implementation of it, but you could also do this same type of deal with other encryption schemes or cryptographic schemes. Yeah. So why do you not like to share the secret? So, what was it, 2420? Okay, so, um, the shared secret, did they have the same 3220? Yep. And then, um, now they can actually use this for to build an app together. So, um, so like, Alice can write down a message. And then she can actually encrypt this using the shared secret. So how she does that is um, I'm using a, a symmetric uh, encryption thing. So basically, it's you choose a password, and that password can be used to encrypt or decrypt a message. So she can use the the shared secret that they're the the, the position they both calculated on the elliptic curve as their kind of like password. She should probably also combine it with like the date or something so that um, it's a little bit more secure. So then she can send that over to Bob. It's like, oh, I got mail. I can decrypt. Now he can read what she said. So yeah, again, this only works if, if I had set this up with a different generator point, he would not be able to decrypt the message. So, um, and he can also, you can also encrypt multiple times with different keys, and then send that. You can send this over to her. And then she can decrypt. So you can like onion wrap. Um, use this as like an onion routing tool. And I think that's actually how how Lightning does it. But that's kind of beyond my pay grade. <laughs> uh, so all right. So. Now we finally start to get to signatures. So the first time I did this talk, I um, implemented CDSA uh, 
using like this the scheme, and you'll see like it it has a and it's, the algorithm is kind of complicated because it involves using this modular inverse uh, property, and that's basically to get around um, uh, <laughs> the um, copyright issues with Schnorr, which is the more elegant way to do it. So this is the algorithm for ECBSA, and then this is the one for Schnorr. So um, Schnorr is sort of like the most obvious way you would you would create a signing algorithm. So the, the goal here is like Alice has a message that she wants to uh, um, give to Bob, but Bob's not sure it came from Alice. So she has to use her um, private key to encode the message in a way that Bob can validate that it really came from her. So basically, this is the, the set of the steps. We've, we've already gone through a lot of these. So for example, um, you choose a private public key pair that's just an integer and a generator point. In this case, they could use uh, Bitcoin's um, generator point and its properties to do this. Uh, you choose a random number. So Alice chooses a random number that's in the subgroup order that she's um, that she's uh, she's uh, going to encode this. In. So question. So, yeah. So all Bitcoin transactions that use ECBSA use the same generator point. Yes. So so all Bitcoin transactions have the same generator point, and so uh, um, they could pro they could probably all generate shared secrets. Uh, yes. Any two any two um, Bitcoin wallets. Could create shared secrets between them, and um, I'm not sure the extent to which people use that, but like that's a, definitely a feature that would be cool to see in the wallet. So does ECDSA use shared secrets, or is it just uh, do something else with it to share that? Um, does ECDSA use shared secrets? No, no. Um, this is more of like a. Uh, the, okay, so the shared secret is, it, you could say that this is like creating a shared secret, where like, no, 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 it's like, it's more of like a public, a publicly, everyone can see her, the signature. Her, 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 her goal is to like, present something that anyone can validate, and doesn't require secret knowledge. But you could combine the two, like you could, she could create a shared secret that also includes the signature, for example. So, um, so basically, she she just chooses a random number. She calculates a position, a point R, which is this number K times G. So this is just another point on the elliptic curve. And then she concatenates uh, her public key, the message R, and whatever message she's trying to send. So in this case, like BTC plus plus is the best. That's her message. This is her value K. This is her private key. So um, basically, she chooses a generator point for, for uh, her public key generator generation. She uses the same public, the same generator point here, and then this is about where um, it starts crashing because I didn't finish it in the last fifteen minutes. But um, the point is that, like, all right. So this basically lets you. And so I, this ECDSA one works, but it's also a little harder to explain. So, um, but the the end result is the same, basically. So the message. And then, oh, could not compute prime inverse for 39. So that's because we're, we need to change the space a bit. Let's apply the private key. Let's apply the private key. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so the remember I mentioned that like East DSA is a little bit more complex because of the mod inverse issue. So um, and because I didn't, I keep. I mean, I chose a space that doesn't have that prime, a modular space to start with. So I think. Oh yeah, I guess I just need to pick a different.
generally you're pointing to like a, a kind of, uh, space. Do we define, uh, how do we define the ability to find subgroup? Three is a very small subgroup. All right, how about this one? That's a long subgroup. So 22 and 35. There's like three values uh, that she needs to communicate, and then he can ver um, Bob can verify this by um, doing this math here. So verify. So uh, over the weekend, I'll probably finish like coding the Shinora version. It's, um, it's still broken, but I think it's time for questions. You said that there are no subgroups in CES. Yeah, so um, there's I can I have a bunch of references here. Um, but yeah, the it's because there's the number of points in sec P T fifty six is prime that there are no subgroups to worry about. So basically if you have a prime number of points, the, the number of the sub number of subgroups is the uh, the um, is the number of divisors of the main group. So if you've got like 35 points in the main group, then there's going to be one subgroup of size 7 and one of size 5. So that's why they choose that the parameter for the Yeah, because if, remember how like, um, so basically there's certain attacks you can do if, if you are in the wrong subgroup from someone else and you're still using the same elliptic curve, and uh, so yeah, that's bad news. And also, it means the space of possible private keys you can have is much larger if you, everyone's using the same parameters and the parameters are maximally, like it's a maximally large set. Yeah. It's difficult to prove this. So, go ahead. Oh, what's the website address? It's kind of small. Oh, um, it's localhost. Just go to localhost. Uh, it's um, my GitHub is for this. Is, uh, well, what, what about the, the droplet that's already being hosted? Uh, yeah, that one doesn't have an uh, domain, so you can just memorize the. Uh, yeah, the address for that. But I'll put it, I, I have a link to the droplet on, on my GitHub. So Do you want to just throw the link in the Yeah. I'm just going to quickly show you the uh, GitHub because it's pretty cool. Uh, so, yeah, so this has links to, um, to the continuous version and how to end the link to the online version. And if you want to set this up with Docker, or if you want to install it this will be on your way on, on your own machine, you can. Uh, all, this also uses like this dashboard generator thing that I wrote. So um, that's kind of what my, my day job is, is making dashboards anyway for <laughs> scientists and um, Bitcoiners. So yeah, that's, uh, thanks for, I really appreciate it. The, the time and the opportunity to speak, and um, it's one of my favorite things to do. So, uh, let me give me some feedback about this, like where we can take this further. I'm kind of starting to work with the, this group called the Time Chain Academy that get, grew out of Clubhouse, um, and we're like just making a lot of random educational material. Um, not really a business model associated with it yet, but. Uh, so anyway, so this this whole course has been growing, and I kind of wanted to start like adding more tabs that build on the previous things. So getting to into actual scripting and and doing cool things with these these tools, but breaking it down into a super small space that you can just look at. So 